Hey everyone, it's Kelly and in this video I am just going to be talking about my experience stitching full coverage and my um, my second attempt at stitching full coverage. When I wanted to do another full coverage project, um, I was finding that it was hard to find videos that were specifically about full coverage. Uh, most of the videos were just about, you know, either uh, just like parking techniques, but what I was really looking for was just listening to other people's experiences, stitching full coverage, what worked, what didn't work, and, you know, just kind of hearing what they like, didn't like, all that kind of stuff to just kind of help me, but it was hard to find that information because it was mixed in with all the regular updates that people were doing, um, and I couldn't just rewatch every single update, so I wanted to make a video that was more specific to um, full coverage projects just in, to make it easier for someone else to find if they're in the same boat that I was in. I'm definitely not claiming that there's anything new or profound in this video, but hopefully it will help someone else in some way. I will also be including timestamps down in the description box for the different kind of sections that I'll be talking about. So if you, if one of the sections you're it's not really helping you or you want to go back to a specific part and hear it again or you know whatever uh, that'll be down in the description box below as well as any other information that I forget to include. This was the first piece that I attempted to stitch. This was something I started about maybe three months into uh, cross stitching as a whole and at that time, there was some videos and information about stitching full coverage and, um, you know, the parking technique. And so I thought I had a pretty good handle and I thought I was going to be able to, you know, just kind of, you know, persevere and work my way through this piece and finish it. And I was completely wrong. I couldn't even finish the first page. And after about maybe a month of working on this, I put it away and forgot about it. One of the biggest issues I had with this was the heavy, heavy confetti. Um, these black bits you see right here, those were the only bits of solid color. And it, for me, it was just, it was such a struggle. I, I I can do some confetti, but when your entire page is confetti, my eyes glaze over. So I had attempted to work in columns doing the parking method. And when you do that method, it does add a lot of bulk to your piece. And so one of the thing that was one of the other problems was it created... <laughs> And see it created a lot of bulk and extra material and it was so hard to get the needle through this so that was one of the problems that I had another thing was when I was working in columns you know at the edge of each column there's there's not as much overlap and so all the bulk ends up being in the middle of the column as you're working and so it creates ridges and you can say that you're going to kind of feather the edges by one or two stitches as you go down but when your piece is this confetti heavy that I didn't find that to make an ounce of difference um, so I guess it just depends on your project how much the feathering a couple stitches over is going to help you with any kind of lines 
that it creates or just the actual bulk in your piece. Another problem that I had working on this piece was trying to figure out how to navigate all the confetti stitching. Even though I was working in columns and that gave me, you know, a boundary to work within, within each square, the colors were just like all over the place. And so I found that really, I just didn't know like where I should be moving around. And along with working in columns and parking, another thing that added bulk for this piece was I had been doing lace knots over on the side when I was finished with a color. And so, you know, if I was finished with a color up there, I would, you know, pull it over to the side, do a little waist knot, and then leave it there. And then you come over, you know, you start stitching down over those threads to lock them in place. Well, not only do you have the thread starting to accumulate because of all the confetti and you know you're just working down you're also covering all the threads that are over on this side so that's additional bulk that was created okay. um, as you can see there's no more waist knots over here and no more parked threads down here um, I was starting to feel like I still wanted to do a full coverage piece and maybe I just needed to give this another try so I decided to just try and finish all my hanging threads and try and just work on doing some of the stitching over here just kind of cross country to see how that was and I was seeing that doing it that way was I think just better for me um, you know, over here with the cross country stitching, well, it's still pretty bulk, would be pretty bulky in the back just because of, I had a bunch of waist knot threads over this way, but. So this is what I was starting with and this is what made me very apprehensive of starting another full coverage piece. Slowly I was, you know, again, getting that itch to stitch a full coverage piece, and so I kept going back to Heaven and Earth and um, some other full coverage sites and looking at the designs, and I knew that picking something that looked very realistic was going to have a lot of confetti like this did, and so I, was, I knew enough to know I can't do something that looks very realistic like a photo and I needed to pick some other kind of design. So then it was just a matter of, you know, waiting to see if I could find some other design that I liked. And luckily for me, I did. The full coverage piece that I decided to do for my second attempt is a kit from Gecko Rouge. Uh, this is called Bohemia and it's by, the artwork is by Medusa Dollmaker. Um, Gecko Rouge uh, recharts or charts uh, artwork from other artists and then they sell the kits uh, to be stitched. Um, all their designs do come as kits. Um, it includes the fabric, the chart, all the floss and uh, does come with a couple needles. Um, I'm not sure what size they are. So down at the bottom it just shows you how big the finished uh, artwork will be uh, depending on the size of the the count of the fabric that you get. They do have, I believe it's just these three options for your fabric and with the 25 count, uh, they have the option of stitching the design one over one or two over one. So that is something 
to consider if you want to go with the 25 count which thread option you want uh, to stitch it with because that's going to determine how much floss that they um, put in the kit for you. And, okay, so this is just the cover page for uh, everything. It comes in this, it's like a big stack of papers. It does have a little thing that you can, that clips onto the side to hold everything together, but it's just easier to work with if you take that off. So first page is just where you can find uh, Gecko Rouge on the internet. And then at the bottom, it has all their contact information. And then the first few pages, it's just instructions and information to get you started on your artwork or on your piece. And then it'll give you a printed uh, floss chart. Um, this is one of the issues that I hear a lot of stitchers uh, that they're unhappy with is the kit does use DMC floss however they don't give you the DMC numbers they renumber the thread um, and I believe that is just a way for them to protect their charts from being resold um, and it, it just helps them keep business for them for the work that they're doing so that they're not losing money um, on the designs that they're creating so that is one of the things with these kits is uh, the floss numbers but if you run out of floss they will send you more floss and you know they do their best to you know, allow for, you know, different stitching styles and giving extra floss so that you don't run out. But if you do, you just, you just contact them and they will remedy the situation. Um, my kit actually, one of the flosses uh, was missing from the kit and I just sent him an email and the next day I got an email back and the floss was in the mail and I got it really quick. It comes uh, for me, it's overseas, and it came really quick, and it, it wasn't an issue. So, and then after the floss, it's just charts. Just the whole book chart. So, all the floss comes on these cards. It's tied up and comes more, a lot prettier than this, but you get the idea. But what I did was I made my own little key cards to uh, have the floss on so that the floss, I made the floss uh, already cut. Um, it's not pre-cut, it's either in a big loop or it's kind of like folded. But So I made these cards and I drew the symbols and then the number that the color comes, or the yeah, that the thread comes with. So if I got confused, I could find it back on the chart and get myself situated. Uh, and having it on these cards has been a lot easier to manage as I'm stitching than working on this big thing. And then if you, they have a lot of extra floss for one of your symbols, it'll come like this. You'll get the extras that you need. Something else that I did just for myself was I made kind of a progress aid, if you will. Uh, I was worried about getting burnt out or losing my motivation as I was working on this. And so I wanted to kind of make something that would kind of help me track what I've done and help me to motivate um, if I was feeling kind of tired of working on it and feeling like I was just lost and not getting anywhere. So I just made a photocopy of the image and then I was able to relatively figure out where the pages were for the design. Um, 
so I you know made these grid marks so I can kind of like track you know finished page and mark it off or just you know kind of see where I am in the design itself and then on the back I made you know uh, like you know at this page when this page is finished I've completed 60% of the design and then I have the stitch count of what I've done so completely unnecessary and only if you feel like taking the time to do but um, it's actually kind of it's been fun to track it this way so there's that now I'm going to find my starting point on the fabric um, I'm going to be starting in the top left corner and so first what I did was I took a tape measure and I measured out you know the length and width of it to find the right orientation of the fabric because it looks kind of square so I just wanted to make sure and then that helps me get a starting kind of guessing point on where to start and um, I have a pretty good amount of uh, extra like border wise so even if I somehow am off a little bit I'm going to be okay so this is actually the height of the fabric and um, I used the dimension sizes that it, that came with the kit first and then um, I kind of guessed in um, I didn't count this little chunk because it's kind of cut into and so I took these three squares and I put a little pin here and I measured down and it gave me um, a corresponding image or a height uh, that the pattern came with and then it gave me a couple maybe four or five squares at the end and then what I did was I went ahead and I counted um, by the blocks to make sure that the stitch count would match the actual dimension. And so I put a pin in there. So this is the very top row. And then I did the same thing for the width. And I, the width gives me a lot more room on the sides here. So um, I went conservative on this side uh, just a little bit so that if for some reason I went over a little bit further I would still have enough border over here so I think I've got about five five or six full squares here and I should have the same on the other side these two pins here let me know that this is the first block of 20 so I think I need to, my first stitch isn't until like nine stitches over and then it'll start. So there'll be like this little like empty section um, over here before I start stitching in everything. And now the fabric is loaded on the Q-snap. Uh, it was a bit tricky getting the fabric in just because it's still kind of stiff and it hasn't been handled and worked and softened up yet so that was a little bit tricky but I just wanted to show my setup for this um, at least for starting out I'm going to be stitching in the well so that means that the fabric is rolled up over like this instead of placing the fabric on the top and rolling back and um, this makes it easier at least if you have shorter margins on the top and the sides where you're starting because then when you flip to the back if you need to tuck your threads the fabric is all the way out and visible so it's easier to move the needle around um, if it was if the fabric was oriented the other way where it's on top like this and then the well part is in the back if you're trying to move if you've got a stitch right here and you're trying to um, bury the thread under some other stitches, there's only so much room that you have to maneuver that needle. So at least for 
starting in this corner part, I wanted to make sure that I had enough room around the sides since I am using the Q-snap and that can kind of um, change how much clearance you have, I guess, for the needle. So that's how that is. And then this is just a little protector thing that I made. Um, I just kind of figured it out in my head. I wanted something, I don't have a project bag for this size of Q-snap and I still, even if I had a project bag, I would still want this covering because what this is going to do is, well, one, it helps to control all the bunched up fabric, at least on this end. You can see here it kind of holds it in place. But what it does is it lets me protect a lot of the fabric that isn't being stitched on because, you know, these are going to take a long time. And so I don't want, you know, just cat hair, dust, dirt. Um, I just don't want a lot of other things like rubbing up against the fabric as I'm working on it. And so um, that will help me protect the fabric a bit and um, this is scrunched up now but it actually extends down to here so then when I'm done stitching for the day I can just pull this down and it'll cover up everything that I've stitched and then once I am progressing through and I'm on the very uh, the far right side of the pattern or the design I can then you know pull this back here so it's going to protect everything that's stitched but I'm still going to have an open space over here to keep working on that far end. And so uh, I don't know how this is going to work out in practice, but in theory, uh, I think it will work really well and help me to just maintain the integrity of all my hard work and um, keep everything looking decent for the next few years while I work on the project. So it's been a couple months and I have finished five pages and I'm on the sixth page right now. So where these letters are, that's right, this part of the design. So stitching on this has clearly gone much better than the first time or, or my first full coverage project. Um, it is just so much easier to work on and to stitch on and part of that is just the design the first one was a very photorealistic image and so it used heavy heavy confetti to create the image that you were seeing and that made it very difficult to work on but with this design you know it's a much more, I guess, simplistic design uh, that uses chunks of color, but it does still have areas of confetti to create definition and detail. And so um, it's a happy compromise for me. Uh, the way I've been stitching on this is somewhat in columns and somewhat cross country. Instead of working just a straight edge column, I'm making a zigzag and I outline that on the pattern itself so that I can follow it and that is helping to prevent any distinct column lines. And so far I feel like that's been working out for me. Um, there's not a lot of background right here, but over in this part, there it it's not noticeable. I can't find distinct delineations of the columns that I'm working in. So I like that method for myself. I'm not doing actual parking. Um, I didn't want to leave any threads 
hanging down at the end of the columns because I knew that they would be hanging for a long time or potentially a long time and I didn't want the threads to kind of get ratty and um, while they were hanging down waiting to get stitched so I I finish the column as far as the thread takes me so sometimes I do go on to the next page just so I can finish that thread um, and not waste it um, but I will do like here I'll do kind of some horizontal parking like with this burgundy color I kind of worked it this way and then that's about where the column ends that I'm working in so I just parked it there so that I could work in here and then when I start over here then I'll pick it up again and move over so here is just a simple visualization of how I mark up my charts. Uh, these black lines are the 10 by 10 grid lines that you find on charts. And then what I do, since I have 25 count magic guide fabric, um, the red marks on the fabric outline 20 by 20 uh, block sections. So I, wherever I've started, um, you know, on that first page, I use that and match it up with the fabric and the chart. And then I highlight where those 20 by 20 grid marks are on the chart. So um, it's, a, it's easy to reference on the fabric and the chart um, to make sure that I'm in the right place. And then, like I said, I outline my zigzags. And these are, I'm working in 15 stitch wide columns. And that's been a, a good amount for me. It's not too small and it's not too big. And so I typically, you know, work within that column. But if a color goes out, um, I will follow it out a little bit. And then I'll come back. If it's a big section of color that kind of like crosses down. Um, I will follow it through the column and outside the column until that thread runs out and then um, I can I keep working here but there will be uh, some outliers in here but again I'm I don't strictly stay in this in whatever column I'm working in and I just kind of follow the thread to wherever the color symbols finish and I can tie off or if it's a big section I just kind of keep going until the thread ends and I can go back to working somewhere in here. Just a quick note about the red markings on my chart versus on the fabric. On the chart I just have the that singular line marked but when you look at the fabric the red markings are going to cover two strands of the fabric. So uh, I don't highlight highlight it on the chart how it looks exactly on the fabric just because I don't want to make mistakes by thinking something's already highlighted and I'm not paying attention. So I just do it on this line. But I remember when I'm approaching this line on the chart, when I'm looking at the fabric, I'm actually going to see two strands that are marked red. Just a note on this cover that I made, um, in one of the previous clips I said that, you know, in theory I thought this was going to work, but you know, we'd see once it was put into practice, and I'm really liking it. So this cover, it spans the majority of the with the cross and I just scrunch it over to the side that I'm not working on so it'll cover that part and then I keep the area that I'm moving or working in exposed and for me it is I, I really like it it's kept a lot of cat hair off of my project and I think it is helping to reduce 
some of just like the hand oil and grime from getting on the project and just sitting there for you know however long this takes me to finish um so right now just because of where i am you know i've got a lot more stitching back there so i have that side covered up but i can just you know cover it up all when I'm, you know, not working on it. And then if I was starting, if I was stitching on the far left of the fabric, then, you know, you'd scrunch it over to this side. So this was covered and then stitch over here. And so I really liked it. You can see some of the design there. I'm going to show you how I start my threads and before I do that I just wanted to show real quick about the red markings for the lines um, let's see where there we go so these two lines have that red mark on them and then if you come up here you can see that the red is on these two lines okay so back to starting my threads So this is where I'm coming up from. This is the bottom left, yes, bottom left of the X. So I kind of pull through. I'm holding on to the tail underneath. I'm going to stick it in right there. I'm holding on to the front thread so I don't pull it through all the way. Pulling the needle back. And then I'm going to come up like I'm about to do the final leg and flip it over so here's the needle on the thread pulling that through and then you can see I've got the little tail there pull it out a little bit more I'm going to cross that over hold it down and pull the thread so now that's anchored in there. Now I'm going to keep going for a little bit. And I'm going to be catching that tail underneath. And I'll do a couple. And then I'll flip over again so I can see the back I know it's a little bit hard probably for you to see but then I just check to make sure that this tail is getting caught for at least you know three or four stitches and then I just oops go on about my way when I'm done with the thread I do it's not always easy but you can see that I do bury it underneath threads. It's a little bit tricky, but it's still able. You're, it, I can still manage it. Close up. You can see these are some threads that I've parked for right now because I'm working down this direction and I'll pick these up once I finish this column and move over here. Here is the back of my work. I don't show this off because I think it's extra neat and clean. Um, it is just so you can kind of see how it looks. Um, sometimes I just, I would find it helpful to kind of see the back of projects um, to see how it how it ends up on the back depending on how they stitch on the front so it's not too bad it doesn't get too messy um as you can see there's times where i do carry my threads a little bit but i i try not to go too far just to prevent bulk from adding up but um like over here this area is very confetti heavy and um probably one of the thickest parts in the project and 
Um, it's not too obvious on the front. I can see where some lumps are from the buildup, but it's not too bad. So it'll still be a work in progress as I keep going through my project, um, trying to find the best way to go about doing the confetti sections to see if I can just reduce that bulk at all. Okay, so there you have it. That is all my experience with full coverage, stitching, um, things that I did with this new piece I'm working on, and hopefully I've covered all the things that I wanted to cover and I can make this into a coherent video. Uh, I've kind of filmed this in pieces, so if things were a little jumpy, I apologize for that, but hopefully it was helpful in some way for you. So thank you again for taking the time out and watching this video and I will see you next time.